here I intend to sum up all of the steps related to cell respiration and therefore I recommend you watch first my discussions on glycolysis, fates of pyruvate, the citric acid cycle, and the electron transport chain to get the full effect and understanding of what I'm about to say here. Now, let me start with the anaerobic respiration because this is very simple. Of course, if we start out with glucose, then we let it undergo glycolysis. After those 10 steps, we are expected to yield two molecules of pyruvate. Now, after that, remember, once we are at the pyruvate level, we ask the question, is there a significant amount of oxygen in the cell or not? And of course, if the answer is no, we will go to this process wherein we generate either lactate or ethanol, depending on the organism. And the story ends there, nothing more. So, this is very simple. So in glycolysis, remember, for every molecule of glucose, you produce two molecules of ATP, specifically from the energy payoff phase, and then two NADH, which you should remember, uh, comes from step six of glycolysis. Now, it so happens that if you, even if you go back to the phase of pyruvate, once you do generate lactate or ethanol, the process that will accompany it is the conversion of NADH to NAD. So in other words, if you have two molecules of pyruvate, that will be two molecules of NADH becoming two molecules of NAD. So notice how I put the arrow here. Of course, this is not the most accurate way of depicting it, but the point here is that if you really think about it, it's as if the two NADH molecules generated in glycolysis are just you know, wasted or used up when you make these two molecules of lactate or ethanol. So in other words, it's just they just cancel out. You just make two NADH molecules to what? Nothing. You just, you just consume them also here. So in that case, that means that uh, NADH becomes NAD once again, so this disappears. They cancel out. Thus, the only yield of ATP for the entire anaerobic respiration process is 2. And the thing here is that the advantage of this anaerobic respiration is that it is much, much, much faster than aerobic respiration around 100 times, as I have read, because, well, anyway, if you think about it, aerobic respiration is much more complicated. There's still a lot of things that should happen. So indeed, it is slower. Though, of course, as a payoff for being slower, you, we can see here, and I'm now about to discuss this, that the energy he yield here is much, much better. So as you, you can see here, our starting point is the same, glycolysis. That's why, uh, before I continue with the other things, glycolysis is not really something you can consider as either aerobic or anaerobic. That is, glycolysis will happen with or without oxygen. Now, come to think of it, since I did mention that glycolysis can happen even without oxygen, so technically speaking, if you say glycolysis is anaerobic, that would make sense. But, uh, of course, that should not confuse you with the fact that uh, maybe if I say that as it is, you might think like that glycolysis is only going to happen in the anaerobic state. That is also wrong. So I'm just here to say that whether we are in the aerobic or anaerobic state, glycolysis will proceed. Anyway, uh, just like a while ago, glycolysis is bound to give us two molecules of ATP uh, right out, okay, right off the bat. Remember, steps that produce ATP outside the electron transport chain are called substrate level phosphorylation, and uh, this is one of them, and then we have this 2 NAD H once again. Okay, then uh, from two molecules of pyruvate, once we uh, uh, discover that it's aerobic respiration time, pyruvate will enter the mitochondrion and be converted to acetyl-CoA, and then enter the Krebs cycle, yielding carbon dioxide. And of course, uh, this should make sense because when I discussed the citric acid cycle, I did say that the point of this one is to completely oxidize the molecules or the carbons of glucose to carbon dioxide. Then, as we know, for every acetyl-CoA molecule, we produce 3 NADH, 1 FADH, and 1 GTP. But since, take note, we have two molecules that's of acetyl-CoA here because we, we, we start with two molecules of pyruvate anyway, we have to multiply all of this by two. 
So instead of 3 NAD H, we actually have 6. Instead of 1 FAD H, we have 2. Instead of 1 GTP, we have 2. Now, of course, as I have taught in the electron transport chain video, the NAD H and FAD H molecules have to undergo oxidative uh, processes such that the ATC will produce eventually the uh, uh, the ATP that we want. We multiply it by the factor 2.5 for every NAD H and 1.5 for every FAD H, giving us the values that we have here. Of course, the GTP does not need to go through the electron transfer chain, but it would undergo a different process. Simple conversion or transfer of phos phosphate will make GTP become ATP. So, also, okay, we should note that two of the NAD H that we are computing here is actually part of the original NAD H. And uh, thus, we should assume that, uh, remember, since glycolysis happens in the cytosol, and the electron transport chain should happen in the matrix, uh, not really the matrix, but basically the mitochondrion, okay, in the end, within it, um, we should assume that there should be a process wherein the NADH could uh, enter first the mitochondrion before successfully being converted to ATP. And thus, you should know here that in order for this to happen, there are uh, transporters or there are mechanisms that we call as shuttles for this to happen. However, since I want to focus more on the computations instead of the other details, I may reserve the shuttles in another future recording. So yeah, once we have all of this down, not forgetting that we have already this one above, all we have to do is to add all of these ATP molecules. 2 plus 5 plus 5 is 12, plus 15 is 27, plus 3 is 30, plus 2 is 32. So that means we produce 32 molecules of ATP per glucose in the aerobic state. Versus 2 ATP, 32 ATP is much, much, much more. Okay. Now, I would also like to note that before, okay, when I say before, probably like two or more decades ago, instead of 2.5 molecules of ATP per NADH, we actually had uh, the number 3 or before we used the 1.5 value for fat age, we used 2. And that was uh, during the time that the mechanisms for the, that allowed us the computation of 2.5 and 1.5 were not as clear as they are today. So if you do encounter the old uh, conversion units, you may end up having a different value here. If you actually use this, um, and then we try to replace all of the 2.5 here by 3, uh, let me do that. And all in the 1.5 here by 2, uh, that would make all the 5s here 6. The and As you notice, things are starting to get messy, but uh, I do hope you can still hear me. So this is 6, this is 6, this becomes 18, um, this becomes 4. So if I add all of that, 2 plus 6 plus 6 plus 14 plus 18 is 32 plus 4 is 36 plus 2. Before, this was 38. So for example, maybe you have in your notes, if you do have one or you have your textbook, it's being mentioned that you produce 38 molecules. That would actually be true if you were using the older conversion units. Okay, and uh, really, I mean, if you're going to ask me, since we should always be updated with information, I, I would really prefer using the 32 value as the uh, updated uh, answer to the question. How many ATP are mole uh, molecules are produced for every glucose in aerobic respiration? Now, therefore... What you see here is a, uh, is a way for us to integrate the things we're discussing so far because maybe as you were traversing through the different videos, you might have been lost in all the information like, oh my god, look at this, glycolysis is like 10 steps. And then pyruvate to acetylcholine in furnace is just one step. But then once you go to the Krebs cycle, this is another eight steps. And, and then the electron transport shade, we already know that there's a lot of things going on there. So it may have you know, led you to uh, some kind of uh, feeling of being lost that we forgot to integrate them and thus this video serves to integrate them together, show you the complete story. And thus, if we are really to recite or you know, mention the entire story of cell respiration, why not go back to the very first equation that I have mentioned before? And this may also be the same equation you were memorizing in your elementary biology classes. That in respiration, which you can think of as the opposite of photosynthesis, though I will not anymore discuss photosynthesis right now, we start with glucose and then we add oxygen. So this is actually the aerobic uh, version of respiration. 
um, yielding carbon dioxide plus 12 water plus ATP. And uh, the, the coefficients here are already inserted to be very accurate. So this is a balanced equation. Well, except the ATP because we already computed how much ATP there is. But now, can you track where we have these molecules? Because, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you will find this beautiful or annoying, but this equation is not as simple as it seems. This glucose molecule, uh, of course, we're going to think, look at this, right, aerobic. This glucose is right here at the very start before glycolysis. And this oxygen, actually, before you forget the fact that oxygen is actually part of the electron transport chain. Remember when I taught it before, I said that this is the last or the final electron acceptor. This is literally the oxygen here. And remember, I mentioned before that every oxygen can handle two reduced cofactors, so be it NADH or FADH. And if we really try to, you know, check and see if everything matches, let's see. If I have six molecules of oxygen here, that means I must have 12 reduced cofactors total. And look how many we have. 2, 4, uh, 10, 12. Thus, uh, we are right on track. Like, everything is balanced so far. Okay? And then, the 6 carbon dioxide, can you find where that is? First, remember, pyruvate has two car uh, 3 carbons. Acetyl has 2 carbons. So I did mention that there must be the loss of carbon dioxide along the way. But since I have two pyruvates, that means two carbon dioxides are lost. So out of the six, two are part of this process, the conversion of pyruvate to acetyl. So minus two, that means we still have four more. Uh, sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm canceling the wrong thing. Out of the two carbon dioxide, uh, four, six carbon dioxides, two are uh, uh, accounted for by this one. So where are the four remaining ones? Maybe you can see it already. It is clearly at the bottom. We know that for every acetyl-CoA, we release two carbon dioxide molecules. And since there are two acetyl-CoAs from every glucose, that's two times two. That's literally four, which now accounts for all the carbon dioxide in the formula. And remember, I also mentioned in the electron transport chain video that for every half oxygen, I produce a molecule of water. So if I multiply, you know, if I make this into six oxygen, um, and if you balance this, the water here would have a coefficient of 12, right? One half is to one, so six is to 12, which is literally the 12 H2O here. And the ATP, once again, we're done with that. So that's it, and this kind of concludes already the cell respiration video. So the next videos, we'll still go back to respiration, but we're done with carbohydrates. So expect the next videos to be more on lipids and other biomolecules, which may be of concern if you're also discussing it in your biochemistry course.